Um, our next uh, panelist is Jan Smitovich. Uh, he is uh, the novelist on our panel. And I want to just read you very, very briefly a couple of bits and pieces from uh, Jan's website. I thought it was uh, very, uh, very clever and, and uh, very interesting. Um, so uh, Jan is a 30-year-old uh, prison survivor, vegan, longtime social justice activist, and the proud father of a vasectomy. His published works include the novels Orange Rain and Redwood Falls, both of which I've read and both of which are incredibly engaging and uh, it was what caused me to sort of reach out to Jan and see if he might be interested in participating. Um, and uh, also the narrative nonfiction piece, uh, Kiss Me Like You Mean It, about some of his experiences uh, doing volunteer relief work in New Orleans after, the hur after Hurricane Katrina. Um, Jan attended the University of California, Irvine, uh, as he says on his website, but only when he felt like it. Um, and he did, however, manage to secure a bachelor's degree in English literature uh, and creative writing, even though he did spend a large portion of his classes writing uh, or, or reading uh, in his bedroom. He did uh, Hurricane Katrina relief work in New Orleans on two separate trips. Uh, these experiences helped shape much of his worldview. Uh, he writes in just about every medium, uh, but literary fiction novels are his main passion. Uh, please help me welcome Jan Smitovich. Thank you, everybody. Uh, can we can we have one last round of applause for uh, the organizers and also for uh, Xander and Sandy who who helped bring us all together here? Okay, very much deserved. Yeah, so uh, I feel like I come to you from a, from a very different perspective of uh, a lot of the people here. Don't look at that yet. Hold on. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, my, my fiction and my writing in general and my, my worldview, which is informed by my fiction, they, they all have a very, uh, are very much linked to the lens through which I see the world. And so, as, as uh, Todd alluded to, I've, I've uh, been through a lot of uh, unusual experiences. You know, I did two years in prison in Illinois when I was 24 through 26 years old. Uh, I'm disabled and, you know, I've done Katrina relief work and I've written seven novels. Um, wrote my first novel when I was uh, 17. But uh, I just hope to kind of offer people a different perspective because I may be one of the few people in this room who don't have uh, letters or abbreviations before or after their name. Uh, so, I know this looks medieval in here, so please, but don't come at me with pitchforks and torches, please. Uh, so, I'm going to be talking about the pathology of human reproduction. Uh, so, uh, first I wanted to say that uh, overpopulation cannot be uh, parsed out without talking about overconsumption or consumption in general because you can have, you know, 20 people who don't consume anything and are living in poverty who, can, who have less of a ecological footprint than one person in the first world. So I don't want to get into consumption uh, in this talk. There's not that much time for it, so, but it is important to keep in mind that overpopulation and consumption cannot, they're in it, inextricable, they cannot be separated. Uh, and one, just I'm just going to give you one little piece of information that says that better than pretty much anything else, and that's uh, if everybody in the world, all 7.4 billion of us, lived at the consumption levels of the average Ugandan, or Ugandan, if, you, uh, if your accent is wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, oops, don't want to break anything. Uh, if everybody in the world lived at the average consumption levels of the average Ugandan, we would still need 1.4 Earth's worth of resources. So that kind of tells you that it's not just a matter of overconsumption by first world privileged, but rather consumption and population. Um, so because, uh, because of how informed by my writing and my fiction uh, my worldview is, I wanted to read you a 
quick little passage from a review of my uh, uh, published novel, Orange Rain. It was done by uh, Professor, Professor Shackelford and Nicole Barbaro. Uh, I've always said or written that uh, quoting oneself is a little bit masturbatory. So I don't know, is this, is this uh, quoting someone else's words about oneself is kind of like masturbating with somebody else's hand. So, <laughs> but I'm going for it anyway, so screw it. Okay, let's see. Smitovich's discussion of the inevitable suffering humans endure throughout life provides a platform to advocate anti-natalism. That's anti-reproduction. The argument that being born is always a serious harm and therefore that producing children is morally indefensible, i.e. antinatalism, is hotly debated. Smitovich, unsurprisingly, does not shy away from this topic, but instead embraces it. Chapter 5 follows the protagonist, Max, to San Antonio, Texas, where he meets a group of social activists. Smitovich depicts a conversation between the characters in which the social activists explain to Max and his friends that procreation is a major obstacle to social revolution, and that all men in the activist group have had vasectomies to prevent procreation, mirroring the real life choices and philosophical positions of the author. What a surprise. The vigor with which Smitovich approaches these issues, if pursued by evolutionary psychological analysis, might improve our understanding of these phenomena. Depression and suicide are often portrayed as pathological. An evolutionary psychological perspective, however, might suggest otherwise. Evolutionary models of psychopathology posit that pathology arises when evolved psychological mechanisms are not functioning as they were designed to function, or when evolved psychological mechanisms produce behavior not conducive to well-being in the modern environment. And that, coincidentally, leads me perfect, perfectly into uh, the next section, which is that overpopulation and Therefore, reproduction is, in the modern world, a, an act of pathology. Um, we start with uh, population and resources. Uh, after deaths, there are 200,000 new people added to the Earth's population every single day. And as you can see here, uh, every new American born will need all these things. 5,000 pounds of bauxite, which is used to produce aluminum, almost 10, uh, 15 tons of iron, 40,000 pounds of cement, all that, three, nearly 3 million pounds of minerals, metals, and fuels in their lifetime. And uh, every new American born means that another acre of wild land is cleared uh, for indus industry, agriculture, and housing. And these are, not, these are not ideological things, these are not uh, conceptual things, these are on the ground things wherein non-human animals and humans as well suffer terribly as a result of this. You know, you just, words like habitat destruction don't really convey the gravity of the situation. Let's see. There's, here's another one about resources. It takes 16 oil tankers of worth of oil to make one year's supply of just disposable diapers in, in the US alone. And I don't know if you know, but these, each of these tankers, these oil tankers, they're bigger than the Titanic. So it's quite crazy. Uh, let's see, I'll skip that one for now. So with the addition of new humans, the uh, existent, population of non-humans has to or is forced to adjust accordingly as you can see by the numbers above. We are currently driving the sixth mass extinction event in the Earth's history. The other five were climate change or uh, asteroid, volcano, you know, catastrophic, uh, natural event related extinctions. But now it's being driven by overpopulation and consumption. And uh, when I say mass extinction, I mean mass fucking extinction uh, to the tune of, according to uh, E.O. Wilson, the famous Harvard uh, biologist, 
uh, about 30,000 species per year. That's not individuals, that's entire species are driven extinct every year uh, in the uh, worldwide by human activity. That comes out to about upwards of 200 species per day. Yesterday, 200 species extinct. Today, 200 species extinct. Extinction is not death, it is the end of birth. Let's see. And here, as you can see, with, uh, as the human population rises, the extinctions rise as well. Uh, you'll notice uh, the spike right around uh, after World War II, which of course is the baby boomer generation. And so these things have a, a very direct correlation in so many different ways. Indeed. Uh, now this is the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. 10,000 years ago, or whatever, 12,000 years ago, uh, at, which is about when civilization is said to have begun with the advent of agriculture. You can see the wild animals in green made up almost the bulk of uh, terrestrial vertebrate bio biomass. And then as the human population grew, especially with the Industrial Revolution, and then again you see it spike after World War II with the uh, use of um, the use of petrochemicals to increase food production. And each, each uh, time the human numbers increase and their correspondent domesticated animals increased, more and more wild animals were pushed off the planet, pushed to extinction. And this, this, is, not just, this is not just hurting animals and the environment. This is hurting us. Um, there's a famous saying among environmentalists that uh, we are all downstream, which means that things that happen in, in Asia environmentally, you know, these factories in China, say, that produce all this plastic crap for, for you know, American widgets. Not midgets, widgets, calm down. Uh, uh, those, that pollution affects all of us. And you can see that probably best uh, exemplified in climate change, wherein things that happen, you know, on the other side of the earth affect all of us. Um, so, another one of the reasons that I, that I find uh, human reproduction today to be pathological is that there are already plenty of children here, unwanted, suffering, and in need of loving, caring parents. There are um, 415,000 children in foster care just in this country alone as of 2014. And then if you talk about global suffering of children, 3.1 million children a year die of starvation. That's 8,000 child deaths every single day. So imagine a program wherein instead of, uh, instead of adding, to, uh, adding further hungry mouths to an already overpopulated world, we're instead taking care of the children who are already here. And uh, let's see, I wanted to uh, also touch on the, the first world versus third world because a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, when in America at least, when you say, when you talk about overpopulation, they don't think about us, they think about, you know, the starving African child with the distended belly from malnutrition and the thing is, though, that because it's so inextricably linked to consumption, uh, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's not that we're just that just the third world is overpopulated. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, to give you, I mean, a lot of people, you know, they'll say they're just stopping at one child. That's okay. One child's okay, but 
how would you feel if uh, uh, an Ethiopian couple said they were stopping at just 19, we're just gonna stop at 19 kids? Well, that's what the uh, consumption and carbon footprint uh, equals. So one child in the first world, spe uh, specifically America, consumes as much as 19 children in uh, third world countries, specifically in this case, Ethiopia. And then uh, the final thing I wanted to mention is that a lot of people think that uh, antinatalism is misogynistic, but I would argue that it's the exact opposite. It's, it's only misogynistic if you look at women solely as uh, reproducers. If that's their sole function in society, then you might think that uh, advocating against uh, reproduction is misogynistic. But in fact, women are much more than just breeders and antinatalism is actually good for women. Uh, there's a few relatively, at least philosophically simple things that can be done to lower the birth rate and all of them happen to be very, very good for women. Uh, one of them is to uh, raise the status of women in cultures where, in, I mean, every culture is patriarchal today, but uh, in especially patriarchal cultures uh, where women aren't allowed to make any reproductive decisions, when you raise the status of women in that society, lowering you know, men's dominance over women, the birth rate goes down because when women are allowed to choose for themselves, they tend to have fewer children. Uh, the second way that antinatalism is good for women is that uh, education also uh, lowers the birth rate. So when you, when you go, you know, people go to third world countries where women aren't even allowed to be educated, you know, and they give them education on birth control and uh, all these, uh, just general ed education, uh, it lowers the birth rate as well. So, and then also, you're not gonna find anybody on the planet more pro-choice than an antinatalist. So that's another way in which it uh, helps women. Um, and you see, the, uh, you see some of these things in the first world as well, wherein uh, uh, the more educated a woman is the the uh, actually the more educated people are the less likely they are to have a high birth rate so it carries across not just in the third world but in the first world as well and then I'm kind of scared to click to this last side nobody has any rotten tomatoes or anything here do they it's an inescapable fact Ooh. that earth is overpopulated when are we going to stop saying congratulations to those, those who had a choice and start saying, how dare you? Hurt me, please, I'm already crippled. <laughs> and I think I'll stop there then. Thank you. Oh, sorry, one last thing. And then, so I've given you the, uh, the children and women reasons for their welfare to uh, be a proponent of lower birth rates or even antinatalist. Uh, I talked about population and resources, overpopulation of wildlife. And uh, then the last thing I'm gonna do is appeal to vanity because that's a good motivating factor, I think. And so, you know, you don't want your baby to end up looking like that because then they grow up looking like that. Thank you. So thank you, Jan. So I wonder if you could, so you tackle a lot of sort of social justice sorts of issues um, and you're also a writer and you manage to integrate these sorts of issues into the stories, into the novels that you write. I wonder, I mean, how do you go about that? Do you, do you have the issue that you want to tackle then you work around it or do you have the storyline and work this, the issue into it? I'm just curious.
curious. That's a great question uh, because it's kind of a hotly debated topic in, in writing and in advocacy. Um, my, I, I'm of the school of thought that the story comes first. You know, the story is paramount. If you don't have a good story, if you don't have good, interesting, compelling characters and a uh, engaging plot, no, nobody can read it. So you, st I start with trying to just write the best book or short story or what have you that I can, and then I and then I kind of use that as a vehicle or medium to uh, express some of my ideals, ideas and ideals on uh, social advocacy. But I think story always has to come first. Okay, so I think we can, we probably all agree here that, that you know, there are substantial problems of overconsumption and that there's a lot that we could do to improve what we're doing. I'm a little unclear on what your sort of end goal is, though, and I was wondering if you could clarify, like with the antinatalist position, I mean, you could say we could reduce our population, that many people could sort of voluntarily elect to not have children, but how far do you think that that ought to go? How, like, should we, you know, I mean, I could see this going all the way to the point of voluntary human extinction. I mean, that would be one way to sure. minimize the, the, the harms that we cause. So, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm wondering, like where where you think this should stop or what exactly we should do. That's a tough question. I mean, I, I think that personal ideology and practicality have to uh, meet each other somewhere. And, uh, you know, native cultures the world over self-regulated their population within the means of their bioregion. Um, and so I think it probably should be left up to, once we get down to a more reasonable and sustainable number, I think it should be left up to uh, individual communities to decide what is sustainable for the region in which they're living. You know, I, th I think I read somewhere that uh, the Phoenix area can support about 23 humans, but there's you know several million living there. So, you know, it's it's about eventually, I guess, the you know working toward more of an end game type scenario. I, I would say that it's it's very important to take into account where you live and what your uh, the resources available to you are there. And like the indigenous communities where, where I live on the, the extreme Northern California coast, uh, you know, they kept their, they self-regulated their population to, uh, to conform to the, to the normal boundaries that are ecological invasives, which now we don't have to do anymore because we get resources from all over the world. 